Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Or original link to the video. Hi, guys. Original link to the video. Top of the description. Below that, link to the Discord. Love to have you. My name's Connor. If you're new, I like to learn. If you're not ready to learn, you're in the wrong class. Omex, or just sit in the back and chill. That's fine. Uh, how on earth did Winston Churchill lose the election directly following Germany's defeat? Good question. Today I found out. Simon Whistler. Officially surrendered on the 7th of May. Nazi Germany officially surrendered on the 7th of May 1945, with the war still raging in the Pacific against Japan and sporting a popularity rate at around 83%, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill seemed a shoo-in to maintain his position as Prime Minister of the British Empire. Just before the announcement of the results of the election, Churchill had been at the Potsdam Conference with US President Truman and Joseph Stalin, only intending to travel home briefly to accept his victory and then back to the conference. Yet, a funny thing happens on July the have been to the Potsdam. Potsdam. Wasn't that in Iran? Conference. Crap, no, that was Roosevelt earlier on. Sorry, never mind. I. With US President Truman and Joseph Stalin, only intending to travel home briefly to accept. Yalta conference is what I'm thinking. Vietnam conference with U.S. President Truman and Joseph Stalin, only intending to travel home briefly to accept his victory and then back to the conference. Yet, a funny thing happens on July the 26th, 1945. The voting populace of the U.K., which had turned out in record numbers of 73%, had decided to collectively say, well, thank you for your service, Winston, but we've decided to go in a different direction. It was a landslide defeat that shocked the world. While in more modern Why? times you might think some sort of scandalous affair or offensive comment may have whipped up the mob on the interwebs, precipitating such a massive electoral fall in the span of just a couple of months, but there was no such issue here. It makes it even more fascinating. So what happened? How did this wildly successful politician, frequently named among the top prime ministers ever in the nation, at the height of his popularity no less, and who had just helped successfully guide Britain through one of its most harrowing periods of its storied history, not just lose, but lose in a landslide. And not only this, making the whole thing even more inexplicable, he lost to a man who one of said man's own party members, Anna and Bevan, stated, seems determined to make a trumpet sound like a tin whistle. Or as the chairman of the Daily Mirror, Cecil King, would remark in 1940, he was of very limited intelligence and no personality. If one heard he was getting six pounds a week in the service of the East Ham Corporation, one would be surprised he was earning so much. Or let's not stop yeah. there, as fame social reformer Beatrice Webb would remark, he looked and spoke like an insignificant elderly clerk without distinction in the voice, manner, or substance of his discourse. To realize that this little non-entity is presumably the future prime minister is pitiable. Or as Churchill no himself charisma. allegedly quip about his opponent, he is a modest man, but then he has so much to be modest about. The demeaning quotes about the man Churchill lost to go on and- That, that hurts. That is a modest about. The demeaning quotes about the man Churchill lost to go on and on and on, and his own party before, during, and after the election likewise tried to oust him as their leader, only to see this quiet, oft-forgotten individual who rapidly rose from a middle-class background to the heights of power defy them all and go on to become one of the greatest prime ministers in the history of the nation, often even ranked above Churchill himself, despite only serving in the position for a handful of years. As ever, of course, the devil is in the fascinating detail, so let us dive in and see what specifically happened to see a titan of history defeated by a man no one outside of the UK even knows the name of, yet shapes the Britain we have today arguably significantly more so than Churchill ever did. To begin with, a little bit of a brief background for the uninitiated. Leading up to becoming Prime Minister in 1940, Winston Churchill had a rather notable career. Born in his family's Blenheim Palace on November 30th, 1874, Churchill was a member of the prominent Spencer aristocratic family on his father's side. As for his mother, she... I put that video up, right? Yeah, I, I reacted to a, a useful charts video on the... Spencer Churchill. He was the daughter was a member of the tree. prominent Spencer aristocratic family on his father's side. As for his mother, she was the daughter of a wealthy American businessman, Leonard Jerome. In the interim between his birth and 1940, Churchill's exploits included variously serving as a soldier in British India, as well as taking part in the Second Boer War, and even at one point he became a famous war correspondent and author. On this latter and oft forgotten factoid of history is that he once even wrote a fictional novel with romance undertones called Savrola, a 
Hill of the Revolution in Lorania, serialized in 1898 and later published as a complete book in 1900. Later in life, Churchill would even win a Nobel Prize in literature. As for his prolific writing, he would variously note this was one of his methods for staving off his black dog or frequent bouts of depression. Back to his political life, and in 1900, it was in October of 1900, at the age of just 25, that he was first elected as a member of parliament, and things more or less took off rapidly from there, including by World War I being selected as First Lord of the Admiralty, a position he briefly reprised during World War II, which for the uninitiated means he was the political head of the Royal Navy. In the years leading up to World War II, fascinatingly, with regards to some things that we'll be discussing later on, despite being a member of the Conservative Party, Churchill was an outspoken opponent of his party's policy of appeasement when it came to Hitler, stating, a country like ours, possessed of immense territory and wealth, whose defense has been neglected, cannot avoid war by dilating upon its horrors, or even by a continuous display of pacific qualities, or by ignoring the fate of the victims of aggression elsewhere. War really super aggressive. I know that in World War One, he wanted the British Navy to just wipe out the the Ottomans in the war by by going into the I think the Dardanelles and just bombarding Constantinople or or Istanbul. <laughs> um, but I I I think it was a disaster for the British. Like a lot of um, there were a lot of mines in the whatever the straits are that lead from the Aegean to the Dardanelles to the Black uh, Aegean to the Dardanelles. Um, but it, it seemed that that all of the that Britain left the attack right at when like they had the chance to win it. Like all of the damage to be done had been done, but they they just left it. I hope I'm remembering that right. will be avoided in President by ignoring the fate of the victims of aggression elsewhere. War will be avoided in present circumstances only by the accumulation of deterrence against the aggressor. He also proposed a mutual defense pact for European nations that stood in the way of Germany expanding and urged Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain to declare if Germany were to invade Czechoslovakia, as seemed imminent, that Britain would declare war on Germany. Going the other way, well, instead Chamberlain signed the Munich Agreement, allowing Germany to annex parts of Czechoslovakia. Churchill's efforts, however, were not totally in vain for his own popularity, with more and more supporters who also felt the British Empire's policy of appeasement was the wrong tag rallying behind him. Things picked up for him from there when, after Germany occupied Norway, the now named Norway debate resulted in a call for a vote of no confidence in Chamberlain's government. Ironically, during this, Churchill, as a member of said government, had to defend it, even as arguments were being made for him to lead the next government. Well, spare you the lengthy details, but needless to say, ultimately, Churchill was chosen as Prime Minister of the eventual coalition government. He would state of this, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and, and this job. trial. That said, nothing was smooth from here, and after France fell, there was a strong push to simply sue for peace with Germany, something Churchill strongly opposed, but with the help of Chamberlain, he was able to keep his position and use his talents as a public speaker to good use in convincing the public the right choice was to continue to fight, as did he, even after a heart attack on December the 26th, 1941, which was supposed to leave him bedridden for a few weeks to recover, but instead, he simply soldiered on, and a mere two days later, was giving a speech to the Canadian Parliament. So, fast forward to the victory over Germany in 1945, and at no point during his time as Prime Minister had Churchill's popularity ever dipped below 78%, and his efforts and actions during it have since generally seen him consistently ranked in the top three Prime Ministers in the history of the nation. Of course, with the end of the war with Germany, there was pressure to hold a general election. Comfortable in his popularity and the job his party had done, ranked in the top three Prime Ministers in the history of the nation. Of course, with the end of the war with Germany, there was pressure to hold a general election. Comfortable in his popularity and the job his party had done throughout the war, Churchill did not fear defeat. However, he nonetheless felt it would be better to continue the coalition government until the war with Japan was over, something that was notably supported by a man by the name of Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labour Party and Churchill's deputy prime minister, who during the war had been tasked with managing matters on the domestic front so Churchill could focus on the war effort. I find that super interesting that when the war broke, out uh that that the that britain like split like it it tasked its two parties with the war planning and designing and then the home effort of the war 
to two different parties. I think that's that's fascinating. In stark contrast to Churchill's aristocratic background, Sattley was born the seventh of eight children to an upper middle class family in Surrey on January the 3rd, 1883. After brief work as a lawyer and then an economics lecturer, Attlee jumped into politics before having all of that interrupted by World War One. After, however, his rise was rapid, first as mayor of Stepney, then member of parliament, and by 1935, the leader of the Labour Party, all despite widespread criticism of the man himself, with many a demeaning quote as previously alluded to. But while Attlee may not have been your typical larger-than-life stereotypical alpha-type leader, Margaret Thatcher would later note of him very accurately, quite contrary to the general tendency of politicians in the 1990s, he was all substance and no show. Going back to Churchill's wish to continue the coalition government until the war with Japan was ended, as noted, his deputy prime minister and Attlee agreed that would be best. And so it was that Attlee brought this proposal Back to Churchill's wish to continue the 90s, he was all substance and no show. Going back to Churchill's wish to continue the coalition government until the war with Japan was ended, as noted, his deputy prime minister and Attlee agreed that would be best. And so it was that Attlee brought this proposal before his party to see how to proceed. Part of the course of his leadership style, however, Attlee did not give his opinion on the matter either way and let discourse about it proceed unguided from the top. Ultimately, his party almost unanimously decided to oppose the continuance. But that wasn't all. There was strong sentiment within the party that with an election looming, Attlee should step down, with the chairman of the national executive of the Labour Party, Harold Lasky, writing to him that many within the party felt that, quote, the continuance of your leadership is a grave hardship to our hopes of victory in the coming general election. Your resignation of the leadership would now be a great service to the party. Just as Mr. Churchill changed Ushenleg for Montgomery before El Alamein, so I suggest you owe it to the party to give it the chance to make a comparable change on the eve of this the greatest of our battles." End quote. Rather than argue or really give any opinion about the matter, Attlee simply replied, Dear Lasky, thanks for your letter, the contents of which have been noted, and then wrote to Churchill of the rejection of continuing the coalition government. Thus, an election was called for and Churchill resigned on May the 23rd, 1945, to await a vote. In the interim, King George VI charged Churchill with forming a new government, often called the Caretaker Ministry today, to oversee things during the election, with this ministry lasting from May the 23rd to July the 26th. And so it was that the unassuming Attlee, who wasn't even popular within his own party and said Labour Party, which had never won a majority in their history, was pitted up against one of the most popular men in Britain and against the Conservative Party, which had dominated for years and had just seen the nation the through one of its most harrowing periods in history and come out the other side on top. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out everything. And in fact, the election was already lost about three years before it even started, thanks to one document, which we're going to get to in a bit. The do you guys think it was the most har harrowing time in British history? World War II? The Battle of Britain? Like, looking back on history, I, I don't think Napoleonic, I don't think Napoleon ever threatened Britain like Germany did, to the extent that Germany did. Um, Crimean War, no. I mean, maybe some of the civil wars? Maybe? But, but other than civil wars, I, I can't think of a more threatening time for the British mainland or British altogether than, than World War II. That would change British history. Just nobody. Not even the late. Everything. And in fact, the election was already lost about three years before it even started, thanks to one document, which we're going to get to in a bit, that would change British history. Just nobody. Not even the Labour Party members realised it until the day the votes were tallied. Of course, Churchill and the Conservative Party's ah, campaign... Sorry. You guys say it's, like, rude for me to... Part of me wants to just say, screw you, I'm drinking. But like for like me to drink from a large, I don't know. Okay, I, I don't know. To get to in a bit that would change British history. Three years before it even... Well, it turns out, everything. And in fact, the election was already lost about three years before it even started, thanks to one document, which we're going to get to in a bit, that would change British history. Just nobody, not even the Labour Party members, realised it until the day the votes were tallied. Of course, Churchill and the Conservative Party's campaign practices didn't exactly help matters. While it seems they'd already lost before they'd begun, their shockingly tone-deaf campaign certainly did nothing to turn the tide, and Churchill himself, known for his amazing oration, continually put his foot in his mouth in remarkably boneheaded ways, more akin to political discussions on the artist formerly known as Twitter than oh, what we think of when conjuring up thoughts of Winston Churchill. Trump. The most famous instance of this was Churchill's infamous Gestapo speech against Attlee and Labour, leading 
Leading up to the speech, Churchill's wife Clementine and several others had advised him to take that Gestapo part of the speech out, but he doggedly soldiered on. So what exactly did Churchill say? No social. What is he suggesting? This government conducting the entire life and industry of the country could afford to allow free, sharp, or violently worded expressions of public discontent. No socialist government conducting the entire life and industry of the country could afford to allow free, sharp, or violently worded expressions of public discontent. So is he saying that socialist governments are are just authoritarian in nature? Or? They would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo, no doubt very humanely directed in the first instance. They will gather all the power to the Supreme Party and the party leaders, rising like stately pinnacles above their vast bureaucracies of civil servants, no longer servants and no longer civil. I actually think he has a good point when it comes to uh, nations that claim to be becoming socialist or communist and end up depressing their people just as much as any capitalist country. Um, but I feel like it, <laughs> I, I, I don't think Atlee in the Labour Party was the Soviet Union or Maoist China at the time. So I, I'd agree talking about like Stalin or Mao getting into power, but maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Needless to say, comparing his own deputy prime minister in Attlee and the Labour Party Attlee led, who'd done a bang up job during the war handling the domestic front so Churchill could focus on the war, to members of the Gestapo didn't sit well with the people for reasons outlined by Churchill's own daughter, Sarah, who would also try to reason with her father on this point. She stated they will certainly not tolerate totalitarianism, but they will not understand why socialism leads to this because socialism as practiced in the war did no one harm and quite a lot of people good. <laughs> Children of this country have never been so well fed or healthy. What milk there was was shared equally. That's exactly why he he made he made way too much of a this response here is just like today where I get so confused with the term socialism. All right. Is so does socialism have a definition or doesn't it? Like because if, if socialism means socialist policies, then every country in the world is socialist. But if socialism means socialism, as described as like the mode of government and what Marx said, then absolutely that was not socialist. But her point, I don't think worded greatly here, it's ridiculous to compare I would say it's ridiculous to compare for Churchill to compare Attlee and the Labour government during wartime to wanting a totalitarian state. So I disagree with the use of socialism here, and I always get confused the more it's used. But I also disagree. But I agree. I also disagree with Winston Churchill's use of of like comparing Attlee to some, you know. Soviet or Chinese socialist leader. Um, so yeah, guys, I, I hate police people. Like, th this is so important for me. Like, is socialism, so like, is socialism, socialism described by Marx and, like, its definition, if you look it up or in the dictionary? Or is socialism free healthcare? Is socialism a police force? Is socialism... Uh, like retirement benefits or any, if you have tax dollars that go in to stuff that helps people, then any nation that collects tax dollars is socialist. And so uh, what, I don't get it. But in terms of just the video we're watching, uh, I agree that Winston Churchill claiming that uh, Attlee was, you know, wanted some sort of Gestapo style authoritarian leadership to achieve his his political dreams is kind of ridiculous in the war did no one harm and quite a lot of people good the children of this country have never been so well fed or healthy what milk there was was shared equally the rich did not die because their meat ration was no larger than the poor and there is no doubt that this common sharing and feeling of sacrifice was one of the strongest bonds that unified us so why they say cannot this common feeling of sacrifice be made to work as effectively in peace hey fair and Sorry, burp there, excuse me.
Bless me. Bless you. Ah. Um, but... Dang it, what was my Stay. point? Um... Yeah, it, it seems like Churchill was too... aggressive and over compensated with his language, but I, I had a point I was going to make about this that I can Oh, yeah. Like, why be so divisive as using a term about the horrible enemy you just defeated to describe a labor party that was in control of a very successful home front effort during the war? Cannot this common feeling of sacrifice be made to work as effectively in peace? This is what I was going to say. Churchill is super, super upper class. He was born at, or and lived at Blenheim when he was a kid. Like, grew up. And so, from my perspective, where I love that is that, like, this is someone who... That's what I was going to say. Just I already said what I was going to say. As for Attlee himself, the next day after Churchill's little early form of Godwin's Law, the blah, 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 blah. online discussion grows larger. The probability of a comparison to involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. Ali would state, When I listened to the Prime Minister's speech last night, I realized at once what was his object. He wanted the electors to understand how great was the difference between Winston Churchill, the great leader in war of a united nation, and Mr. Churchill, the party leader of the Conservatives. He feared lest those those who had accepted his leadership in war might be tempted out of gratitude for having followed him further. I thank him for having disillusioned them so thoroughly. Sick burn. Him further. I thank him for having leadership in war. He feared lest those who had accepted his leadership in war might be tempted out of gratitude, out of gratitude for having followed him further. And okay, all right might be tempted out of gratitude for having followed him further. I thank him for having disillusioned them so thoroughly. Sick burn. Nevertheless, burn. seemingly not reading the room, Churchill would double down on this sentiment in later speeches in the following broadcast, stating, In the socialist system, all effective and healthy opposition and the natural change of parties in office from time to time would necessarily come to an end, and a political police would be required to enforce an absolute and permanent system upon the nation. And yet again, in his next, under socialism, central government is to plan for all our lives and tell us exactly where we are to go and what we are to do and any resistance to their commands will be punished and that no change of government would be allowed under them because their executive quote could not allow itself to be challenged or defeated at any time in any form of parliament they might allow the level of tone deaf this was to the people of the nation cannot be understated as to why first as churchill's daughter sarah has pointed out the people had just seen how even in the worst of times some of these so-called socialist ideals instituted by the labor party during the war kept things running relatively smoothly regardless of the otherwise extreme circumstances do you guys think that had Churchill taken the approach of, you know, not demonizing him and just saying, like, I'm running again, please vote for me, I respect Atlee, he did a great job at home, but I believe I'm the one that should continue to lead the country here, that he still would have lost? Or do you think he would have won with that message? But there was another huge factor, which brings us back to the aforementioned empire-changing document, the Social Insurance and Allied Services Command 6404, aka the Beveridge Report, publishing in November of 1942, written by economist William Beveridge, with contributions by his wife, mathematician Janet Beveridge. Among other things in the report, it proposed, after the war, the establishment of a national health service, social security, a number of full employment practices, and other similar measures, in all providing its citizens with a base support from the cradle to the grave for the benefit of all of society. So popular was this document that over 600,000 copies of it were sold and its ideas disseminated, now unprecedented for what was, after all, just a government document on recommendations to help heal and rebuild the nation after the war. In essence, the people of the nation who just had their lives upended for years were seeking some security and a return to normalcy. And this report showed how this could be achieved quite quickly. They'd also just seen what the government could accomplish in war and how working together in this way and focusing money and efforts on the goal produced extraordinary results. 
So why not spend just a fraction of the money that the war cost on home front improvements and stability? As one contemporary commentator stated, we have shown in this war that we British don't always muddle through. We have shown we can organize superbly. Look at these invasions of the continents which have gone like clockwork. Look at the harbors we have built on those beaches. No excuse anymore for unemployment and slums and underfeeding. Using even half the energy and invention and pulling together of what we have done in this war, what is there we cannot do. We have virtually exploded the arguments of old fogies and better notters who have said we cannot afford this and we must not do that. If we can do it in war, why can't we do it in peace? So there's a clear, you know, central thing here that, that I'm noticing and the difference is that the British people had experienced an extraordinary amount of camaraderie uh, cross class where like everyone had to suffer in some ways and work together in order to pull out through this conflict and you did it very well and people saw that and and loved that feeling and maybe saw Winston Churchill's aggressive nature of wow this person who wants to do all this this and this and people are like well we we were in the home front and that's who's voting for you and you did a really good job and we had a great sense of togetherness we haven't felt for a long time if ever and you're just like trashing that which will make people not like you and and think that going with the party of the maybe making the labor party the in charge of the home front instead of like a you know that and them doing such a good job is what made them have you know atley be the prime minister rather than just the winston churchill screw-ups in, in in speech going back to churchill and the conservative party's campaign messages they didn't just not focus on these very real issues in the nation at the time and vilified the party that was continued comparing them to nazis but also continued to press the message that just because germany was defeated the time for sacrifice and fighting abroad was still at hand with churchill stating five years ago i promised you blood toil tears and sweat and your untiring response brought up us, in the end, victory over Germany. Today, we still have tears. Not so many, thank God. But the conquest of Japan, hand in hand with our American allies, is a formidable undertaking which we must and will see through to the end. But he didn't just stop with Japan, stating, And we must still look forward, alas, to blood and sweat. We have a terrific task ahead of us. We have a shattered world around us, and we must help to rebuild it. We must strive for a sane and just peace, which will save us all and our children from that constant fear of war. That is why I am asking today for the support of all men and women of goodwill. During the war, I rested my trust in the British people. Time after time, I warned them of the dangers ahead, and they never failed. Once again, now, today, I must tell you that, in spite of all our victories, a rough road lies ahead. What a shame it would be, and what a folly to add to our load the bit of quarrels with which the extreme socialists are eager to convulse and exploit these critical years. For the sake of the country, and of your own happiness, I call upon you to march with me under the banner of freedom towards the beacon lights of national prosperity and honor, which must ever be our guides. In contrast to a message still focused on sac- I feel like that was pretty good, and ex if you just left out, if you just like left out this part, even though like this is the one part directly attacking your opponent, if you just like, I feel like Winston Churchill's greatest chance of of winning the election would be to just like not like the part of Winston Churchill that kind of rubs me the wrong way is how affluent he grew up. Clearly upper class. There was an upper class, lower class feeling every country in the US too. Um, but it seems like it's really there in Britain. You know, there there are people here who were born into extreme wealth because of you know their their parents, but th there's not that like hundreds of years insurance of like these people are rich, 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 rich down. And the fact that Winston grew up in that and then was attacking the person so harshly that was in charge of the, you know, collectiveness and breaking down of, of barriers and th that happened in, in the in the war years on the home front. I'm speaking too much. I'm reiterating stuff I said. And exploit these critical years. For the sake of the country and of your own happiness, I call upon you to march with me under the banner of freedom towards the beacon lights of national prosperity and honor, which must ever be our guides. 
In contrast to a message still focused on sacrifice for matters abroad, Ali stated the Parliament of 1935 had a big conservative majority and the policy pursued by the conservative government landed this country into war. It was due to the action of the Labour Party that this conservative government resigned. Mr. Churchill, who had opposed his own party, formed an all-party government which successfully brought us to victory. Now a new parliament must be elected. The choice is between that same conservative party, which stands for private enterprise, private profit, and private interests, and the Labour Party, which demands that, in peace, as in war, the interests of the whole people should come before those of a section. Dang. That is good. Labour puts first things first. Security from war, food, houses, clothing, employment, leisure, and social security for all must come before the claims of the few for more rent, interest, and profit. If the whole world, the whole allied world was voting for a British prime minister, I'm sure Winston would win, but that's not the case. It's, it's the British people that are voting for you. They're British people who were the ones at, at home, right? Uh, were ones that, that, which is, I'm sure, the vast majority of, of your voter base isn't the people who are at war, but the ones who are at home who experienced great success and, and, and quality uh, under the labor to then not see that. I, I think that was an amazing We've point. shown that we can organize the resources of the country to win the war. We can do the same in peace. These contrasting messages- I keep making the same points, but there keeps being points in the video where I want to say it again. Indeed, at the heart of the two campaigns, with the conservatives using slogans like, finish the job, in contrast to Labour's, let us face the future. On their future, Labour had a very defined plan for fixing the war-torn nation, suffering from a massive housing crisis after all the bombings and a number of other extreme issues. Labour was promising to solve all of this, including full employment, in part by nationalising staple industries like coal, steel, railways, electricity, aviation, etc. They also proposed social security, healthcare for everyone, more workers' rights and affordable housing. What's more, once again, given how well they'd done at managing similar things on the home front during the war, the people believed they had the skills to do it. Going back to the Conservatives, while they did propose some things like improved housing and even a national healthcare system, the promises were vague and ill-defined, as well as emphasizing letting the private sector, not the government, figure it out, and otherwise completely drowned out by the rest of their message of focusing abroad. With a nation sick of war and on the verge of bankruptcy, talk of continuation of the war indefinitely wasn't exactly popular as you might imagine. After all, at this point, nobody knew how much longer it would take to defeat Japan. The Allies had more or less defeated Nazi Germany a couple of years before Germany actually was forced to surrender. Further, another line in the Conservatives' campaign was to illustrate the potential threat the Soviets and communism held on the whole, all of this seemingly giving the impression of a party bent on war indefinitely. And indeed, Churchill was extremely concerned about the Soviets, stating without Germany, what will lie between the white snows of Russia and the white cliffs of Dover? He also asked his military leaders to devise plans to counter the Soviets should they try to push further into Europe, as well as making plans to ally with Germany and the US against the communist threat. On top of this, as alluded to in Attlee's aforementioned speech, many were angry at the Conservative Party for their policy of appeasement before the war, which ultimately led to the disaster that followed. That Churchill had been leading the charge against such at the time didn't matter. His party was still deemed responsible. Thus, with the Conservative Party's perceived mismanagement of events leading up to World War II versus Attlee and the Labour Party's own extreme successes at managing domestic matters during the war within the coalition government, combined with the Conservative Party as a whole seeming to have no real hard plan that appealed to anyone for how things would be managed after the war rather than continually pushing the spectre of fear of more wars, all along with the general consensus that the Conservative Party would win in a landslide because of Churchill's popularity, ultimately led to its rather stunning defeat. This is something that should have been easily predicted, even before the election, as polls have been showing for a few years that Labour, not the Conservatives, were leading the popular vote. And in fact, in February of 1945, polls showed that it wasn't even close, with an 18% lead by Labour over the Conservatives. However, as such polls at the time were something of a novelty, few took them very seriously. And so it was. In a landslide victory of 47.7 to Labour and 36% to Conservative, the largest swing from Conservative to Labour in the history of British general elections. Churchill was out. Attlee was in. Perhaps. On this, neither Attlee nor his party had really thought they'd win either, and now that they had, they decided it was critical to give Attlee the boot. Thus, on the very day of victory, they told Attlee to wait to go to the king until they could elect a leader, even though publicly, up to this point, they had been putting Attlee forward as that leader throughout the election. So what are you doing, Labour? What? I mean, he becomes the Prime Minister, so... None of it, stating, you cannot win an...
leaf forward as that leader. That's for, I mean, it's a different method of power, but like, imagine, like, that's like, like, I imagine, like, uh, like, <laughs> like running, running someone for president, like a Republican or a Democrat, and then they win, and then just like switching it for another person <laughs> at the end. Throughout the election. It's different, I know. But. Ali was having none of it, stating, you cannot win an election and then say the question of the premiership is open. If you are invited by the king to form a government, you don't say you cannot reply for 48 hours, you accept the commission, and you either bring it off successfully or you don't. And if you don't, you go back and you say you can't and advise the king to send for someone else. His party didn't agree, however, and continued to scheme. Once again, true to his nature, rather than bother to argue further, he simply took action. Unbeknownst to his party, Thatley left and accepted the king's invitation to the palace. Upon returning to his scheming party members' victory party, he told them what he'd done, and the matter mostly dropped from there. As the meeting with the king, apparently none too pleased with the change, when Attlee arrived, they both at first stood in silence, staring at each other. As things became awkward, Attlee finally broke the silence, stating, I've won the election. The king then brusquely stated, I know, I heard it on the six o'clock news. What would follow during Attlee's reign were some of the most sweeping changes in British governing history, setting the table for NHS? many staples of the government and policy since, such as the National Health Service, expanding the 1944 Education Act, the National Insurance Act, which provides unemployment and sickness benefits, and spearheading building over a million new homes in England, Scotland, and Wales in the next six years to replace those lost during the war despite material shortages. Further, with the focus more firmly on the home front rather than matters abroad, Attlee and his government's policies also very intentionally saw the acceleration of the end of the British Empire and decolonization throughout the I was going to mention that about uh, you, if you are going to turn inward rather than the conservative, uh, more kind of, I guess, upper class, even though, is that you have to accept that the UK is is going to be much less powerful. That maybe, and and I'm not saying that's reason to not do it, but you can't dislike the conservative leadership, but like the power of that Britain holds, and think that power is going to stay, in taking the Labour Party approach. And again, even that taking that into consideration, I think it's perfectly reasonable to accept that and even want that. Just pointing it out. The world. In all, his brief, only about half a decade run, ultimately defined much of British politics for the next few decades. Now, going back to Churchill, this wasn't his end. You see, while the defeat sent Churchill into one of his occasional depressive spirals, and when the king had offered him the Order of the Garter, he declined, stating that the people had already given him the Order of the Boot. But he ultimately accepted defeat cordially. When his position quipped that the British people were ungrateful, Churchill reportedly replied, I wouldn't call it that. They've had a very hard time. He would also state, They are perfectly entitled to vote as they please. This is democracy. This is what we've been fighting for. And speaking of fighting, Churchill was still the leader of the opposition, and after Attlee and his government had done their thing and relative stability was restored, Churchill and the Conservatives managed to win in 1951, with the then 77 and ailing Churchill nonetheless once again resuming as Prime Minister despite a series of strokes preceding this. <laughs> Ailing Churchill, nonetheless, once again, and the Conservatives managed to win in 1951, with the then 77 and Ailing Churchill, nonetheless, once again, resuming as Prime Minister despite a series of strokes preceding this. During office this time, he particularly focused on continuing to strengthen relations between the US and Britain as the best way to preserve peace in the face of the Soviet rise, as well as to attempt to negotiate an end to the Cold War. On the side, given all his work with the US during his time as leader, in 1963, John F. Kennedy would declare Churchill, by act of Congress, an honorary citizen of the United States, one of only eight people in history to be given that honor. As for Attlee, he would Where'd continue the to lead the Labour Party for a handful of years after his time as Prime Minister, before ultimately stepping down at the age of 72 in 1955. He was then elevated to Earl Attlee and took his place in the House of Lords, among other things notably helping to establish the Homosexuality Law Reform Society with the goal of decriminalizing homosexual acts. Today, Attlee is almost always listed near the top of greatest Prime Ministers in UK history, often ahead of Churchill. Of this man, who seemingly everyone had been underestimating his entire career, despite the fact that 
he had very quietly somehow managed to rise extremely rapidly from an upper middle class family background to the highest levels of government and seemingly also very quietly doing an incredible job at every level, he allegedly wrote this limerick that aptly summed up his career. Few thought he was much of a starter. There were many who thought themselves smarter, but he ended up PM, CH, an OM, an Earl, and a Knight of the Garter. Really good video. Um, I do see the end of the World War II at like as not not when I say like this in in Britain or the British Empire, I just mean its influence on the world. Like you you go from being a like a dominating world power, unquestionable in any world conflict, you have to be taken into account to not that and kind of America on this way. But the, the question of why Churchill lost absolutely was answered in this for me. I think it was a great video. Um, and it, it's like, it's, a lot of it is answered by the fact that Winston Churchill wasn't just the, the only one who got, and the conservatives who got Britain through World War II. It was also the labor movement who got Britain through World War II. They were in charge of the home front, the voting base who are obviously going to be grateful that they won the war through Winston Churchill and, and their government, their party, his party. But to demonize him and use terms like Gestapo, the worst part of the enemy you just defeated, just extremely tone deaf, as Simon said in one of his sentences in the video. Very interesting video. Great. Glad I watched it. Hope you guys are doing well. Would extremely, would really, <laughs> extremely, would really appreciate any comments answers to any of my questions and um hope you guys are doing well i'll see you guys next time bye